doing business in a global environment, uh, no longer is the U.S. economy in its own little bubble. Uh, you have uh, Brazil, China, India, um, a lot of them being affected from the latest uh, COVID outbreak. And there might be some more, you know, uh, global issues moving forward. Uh, Russia, you know, going to war with Ukraine. Lots of things have really disrupted the international markets now. But that's why this chapter is so important. It's because it's an ever evolving, ever changing. Um, you know, the US has kind of claimed that top spot for a while, but there's definitely some big competitors there. And uh, let's talk about the pros and cons of living in an international uh, business world, because there absolutely is. Many students um, want to, you know, do already speak another language or want to learn another language. Maybe Spanish is a really popular one, Mandarin. And uh, these can absolutely help you out in the business world because more and more businesses are operating in many countries. Um, so over 90% of companies doing business globally believe it is important for employees to have an international experience. So another language or being traveling or understanding other cultures. Um, most businesses are, are doing a, uh, work abroad. Two key terms here are importing versus exporting. Uh, we both do this in the United States. We import and we export. Some common imports are coffee, right? Uh, uh, avocados. We get them from uh, Mexico. Uh, we import olive oil from from Italy. We get wine from France. We get uh, rice from Vietnam. Uh, you know, you name it. There's there's countries supplying with with all kinds of things, and with the reason we do this is because their environment, their local ecosystem, is better off they have a, an advantage to naturally make these things versus if we were to make our own rice, we would be using a lot more water. We'd be using a lot more uh, mountainside. And so this allows um, the whole world, the global market to make things more efficiently, but also it provides jobs and money to those countries at the same time. And then it gets us the ability to have rice and things like that at a much cheaper price because they're making it with less resources, right? So it's a win-win for everybody for the most part with, with free trade. Uh, but again, there's some disadvantages as well we'll get into. And then exporting, this is great for us as well because it allows us to sell our products and services to somebody else. So something I'm doing right now exporting is I'm recording this video here in the United States, but you could watch it anywhere in the world, right? So I'm exporting my my teaching to other places. Uh, some students are international students. They come to California or wherever and they take classes and they pay the tuition to the local school. So we are we as the United States are getting that money and it's going there, it's being taxed, right? So it comes back into our economy. And then the, the, the student gets the uh, educational experience in the United States, right? Uh, but we also export steel and cars, right? Ford and Chevrolet, we send out our cars, Tesla, things like that. We, we sell a lot of stuff. We sell American whiskey, uh, California wine, uh, California milk and dairy, all kinds of stuff. We are the largest importing and the third largest exporting nation that might've changed. We're, we're definitely in the top three for both though. Uh, why trade with other uh, countries? We just talked about it that, you know, you have the benefits of cheaper goods and services for your local economy while providing jobs for everybody. It's, it's a it's a win-win for most people in, in a good free trade environment. But there are ways in which you can take advantage of those environments that we're going to talk about in a moment. Uh, we talked about students in school. Uh, so here's trade protectionism, which is the opposite of free trade, right? Uh, when the government... Uh, impo uh, either does a tariff or, or some other things. So um, we believe that um, we need the government to protect our local jobs. I mean, there's a big argument, right? You, you hear middle America, a lot of these car companies and manufacturing plants that are making nails or screws or whatever they're making, you know, it's cheaper for them to move their factory to another country where they can pay the workers a much lower price, right? That's the argument. And so people say we need to stop letting that happen because it's ruining the United States, you know, less jobs for people, average Americans. Americans and when average Americans lose their jobs and they can't buy a house, they can't afford their family, etc. So our government does actually do some protectionism currently, and one of them is a tariff. It's a tax imposed on imports. So for example, uh, cars, if a certain amount of a car is not produced here in the United States and just comes in on a cargo bin on a boat, we might we might charge a two to five percent tariff on that car. Um, to, to kind of prevent them from being able to produce a car much cheaper than we can locally um, so we can compete more as far as in price. Uh, we might also just have an import quota, which is just basically like we might just tell Toyota, you're only allowed to bring in 500 cars or you're only allowed to bring in 1,000 cars a year. We're literally, we limit the amount of something being able to come in uh, to uh, our country. And we might even like st stagger it. We might say 1,000 cars 
limit. And then after that, every thousand after that, there's a 20% extra, extra um, tariff on top of it. So, um, and then there's embargo where we just completely say, no, we will not trade with your com country anymore. That's what we're doing with Russia during the war. Um, it's also what we do with North Korea. And we used to do with Cuba as well. We used to not s s uh, import or export with Cuba. But a lot of those are changing. Um, the re another reason why we don't like, some people don't like free trade is that, you know, China can make really, really cheap steel and then say, hey, we're going to sell it to you for a dollar a pound. And maybe locally we're producing it for five dollars a pound. So for with the 80 percent cheaper price, you know, people, all these companies that need steel would just say, oh, China, give me your steel. Give me your steel. That's so cheap. Give it to me. Give it to me. And so it really it's called dumping, right? When you just dump a bunch of a product for super cheap on a company uh, or on a on a country, it really really messes up the local economy. So uh, we try to prevent that from happening. It's called dumping. Um, we also have here we have it's called NAFTA, but it was recently changed by Donald Trump a few years ago. It might change again, but it's now called the USMCA, United States, Mexico, uh, California, United States, Mexico, Canada agreement. And uh, basically it allows us to do more free trade with some restrictions within our landlocked countries. So for those of you, uh, uh, geography, you know, we have Canada right above us in the United States. We have Mexico right below us. So we have a special agreement with them so that we can have goods and services cross the borders very easily. And we do a lot of uh, importing, exporting of dairy and, and alcohol and, and pharmaceutical drugs and, and many, many more things. Um, but it helps reduce reduce those trade barriers and allows us to trade more evenly. Um, so here are the pros and cons. We've kind of talked about all of them, but here's a good summary of what we've just talked about. And then there's the idea of outsourcing where, uh, you know, for example, call centers. A lot of times you call customer service and you might be talking to somebody in another country that's called outsourcing because it's much cheaper to pay somebody in another country to do that labor. Uh, for example, the Philippines is one of the largest hubs for call centers in the world. Same with India. Um, and it's just cheaper to hire people there. Uh, China is a booming market as well. So here are the pros and cons of offshore outsourcing, where you are moving your jobs to another country, uh, but they're staying here. So like Dell tech support or McDonald's tech support. Um, when you call in, it's an offshore uh, outsourcing. Um, a lot of people do outsourcing for accounting. Um, there's there's manufacturing. There's many things you could do offshore. You know, Nike makes their shoes in other countries, not in the U.S. Uh, a lot of the time. And so those are the pros and cons of that. And that's what we got for uh, international business, doing business uh, all over the world. And uh, let me know if you have any questions.